Okay, so, welcome to this video. In this video, what we're going to talk about is ATP binding cassette transporters. Okay, and for short, ATP binding cassette transporters are often abbreviated to ABC transporters. A for ATP, B for binding, and C for cassette. So, ABC transporters. Okay, and this is a large family of transporters that you find uh, throughout all uh, members of the animal kingdom. Okay, and there are 49 different ATP binding cassette transporters within humans. Okay, right. So, the structure then for this video, what I want to start off with is a discussion of the difference between a channel and a transporter. And then what I want to talk about is uh, the 49 different ABC transporters in humans and how we designate them into seven families. And then uh, we will talk about the structure of ABC transporters. We'll talk about full transporters and half transporters. And then what we'll do is we'll have a look at the way that an example of an ABC transporter, for which we'll use the multi-drug resistance protein 1, MDR1, uh, which is also known as ATP binding cassette transporter B1, okay, uh, we'll use that as an example of uh, how these things actually function. And overall, very little is actually known about ATP binding cassette transporters. They are not a hugely studied field, okay, but they're emerging just how important they are. And the main ones which have been studied in detail are the ones which are responsible for drug resistance, okay, and MDR R1 or ABCB1 is an example of one of those, which is very important in uh, resistance within certain forms of cancer cells uh, to uh, chemotherapy treatment. Okay, right. So let's start off with what is the difference between a channel and a transporter. Okay, so we'll do channel versus transporter. Okay, right. So basically, a channel is a structure within the cell membrane which allows um, solute molecules to move through and generally it's ions that are going to move through channels and basically all the channel is is a protein which has a pore down the middle okay so a hole that effectively moves all the way through the membrane like so which will allow uh, solute molecules which are polar and generally we're talking about ions to move through it and basically it's just a way to move across the membrane without having to go through the hydrophobic core of the lipid bilayer basically. Okay so uh, this is what a channel is. Now channels are all passive okay so what this means is that the net movement of solute molecules that you will get across the membrane that will go through these channels will be in the direction uh, that the electrochemical potential gradient tells the solute to move. Okay, so you'll always get solute moving through channels down the electrochemical gradient. And the electrochemical gradient just means a combination of the concentration gradient and also the electrical gradient. So you take into account the concentration gradient and the electrical gradient and work out overall what direction so the, should the solute move. And uh, basically, if you put channels in the membrane, the solute will move in that direction. Okay, so you don't have the movement of the solute against the concentration, well, against the electrochemical gradient. I should say electrochemical gradient rather than concentration gradient because electrochemical gradient takes into account both the concentration gradient and the electrical potential gradients that could be across the cell membrane. Okay, right. Uh, so, another thing to stress is that the channel doesn't really take much of an active part in the transport of the um, solute molecule. It basically just sits there and allows the solute to move down the hole through the middle, basically, which is called the pore. Okay, it doesn't undergo any conformational changes that help the solute to move across. The solute just moves through it and doesn't really change the structure of the channel that much. Okay, this is in contrast to a transporter. So let me now show you a transporter.
basically a transporter is going to um, actually undergo a vast conformational change in order to move the solute molecule across the cell membrane. Okay, so let's say here is our transporter, and let's say our transporter is going to move solute molecules from the extracellular fluid into the cytoplasm, okay? And um, transporters which do move things into the cytoplasm are known as importers, whilst things which move them out of the cell are known as exporters, okay? So we're going to imagine that our transporter is an importer, okay? so. Currently, the transporter is facing in the, the outward um, direction, basically. So it's in the outwardly facing state, okay? Which means that the ligand binding domain is facing out to the extracellular fluid. Okay, so what will happen is then the ligand, which will be some sort of solute molecule, will bind to the transporter on the outside. So here is our ligand for the transporter, the thing which is going to actually be transported. And when it does, that will trigger a conformational change in the transporter protein. And now what will happen is uh, the solute will end up being moved when the protein undergoes this conformational change. And what you'll end up with is, oh dear, I've drawn the membrane right through the middle, but never mind. Okay, what you'll end up with is something that looks like this. Okay, you'll now end up with the ligand binding domain facing into the cell, and then the molecule is also facing into the cell. So you've moved the solute from being on the extracellular aspect to being in the cytoplasmic aspect. Okay, so we'd now call this the inwardly facing state, or the inward state. Okay, I think I'll stick to inwardly facing state, since I used outwardly facing state. Okay, right, and now what will happen is the ligand molecule will have a much lower affinity for the inwardly facing state, so it will cleave off. Okay, so it will break off the inwardly facing state of the uh, transporter protein. And when it does, that will leave the transporter protein now with no ligand attached. And of course, what was driving the transporter to be in this conformation in the first place, where it faces inwards, well, it was the binding of the ligand. So if you remove the ligand now, the transporter will return back to its outwardly facing state, basically. So it will go back to the outwardly facing state, and then another molecule can come and bind, and then uh, will trigger it to change conformation again and face inwards. OK, right. So transporters, every single molecule that is transported across the cell membrane by a transporter requires the transporter to undergo a fast conformational change. Contrast that to the channel which just basically sat there and allowed the solute molecule to move through it. Okay, so that's the main difference between transporters and channels. Now, Transporters can be either passive or active. Channels can only ever be passive. Okay, they will own, they will just allow solute to move down its electrochemical gradient. Okay, transporters can also be passive. They will just have a, produce a net movement of the solute molecule uh, f um, down its concentration or electrochemical gradient. Okay, so you'll have the movement down the electrochemical gradient. Okay. Alternatively, they can be active, in which case they move solute molecules up their concentration gradient. Sorry, up their electrochemical gradient. Uh, I, I'm sorry that I keep saying concentration gradient. I mean electrochemical gradient. Concentration gradient is only one part of the electrochemical gradient. Okay, so active transporters instead will move uh, molecules against their electrochemical gradient. Okay, they will move them up the electrochemical gradient, and I'll abbreviate electrochemical gradient usually just to EC, but I should at least write it once. So electrochemical gradient. Now, there are two forms of active transporter. There are active transporters which uh, couple the movement of the solute molecule up its electrochemical gradient to a chemical reaction, okay? Uh, because as soon as you move solute molecules up their electrochemical gradient, then you are 
doing something that is thermodynamically unfavorable, okay? You are taking a low energy state and turning it into a higher energy state, basically. You are making the electrochemical gradient worse, and there is energy stored in the electrochemical gradient. So when you make the electrochemical gradient worse, you have to be putting energy in, okay? So where are we going to get this energy from? Well, either we can get it directly from chemical reactions, basically. Okay, so if you get the energy from some chemical reaction, okay, uh, chemical reactions, okay, uh, then you are known as a primary active transporter. And the sort of archetypal example uh, of primary active transport would be where you use ATP to hydrolyze uh, and um, that will release the energy that drives the primary active transporter. Okay, so the usual chemical reaction that you couple the primary active transport of the solute molecule to is ATP hydrolysis. So this energy usually comes from ATP hydrolysis. Okay, right, and we're going to see that all of the ATP binding cassette transporters are primary active transporters. Alternatively, there is also secondary active transport. And in secondary active transport, what happens is uh, you move one solute molecule up its electrochemical gradient, and you couple that to the movement of another solute molecule down its electrochemical gradient. Then when you move one solute molecule down its electrochemical gradient, uh, that will release energy. Okay, so let's say we have molecule green here. And molecule green, uh, green's electrochemical gradient favors the movement of green this way. Okay, so let's say we have a membrane here. So let's say green wants to move inwards. Its electrochemical gradient favors the movement of it inwards. Okay, uh, so if we allow green to move inwards, that will release energy. And we can use that energy then to move blue, let's say, up its concentrate, electrochemical gradient rather. Um, okay, so providing the amount of energy released by green going down its electrochemical gradient is greater than or equal to the amount of energy that you need to put in to move blue up its electrochemical gradient, then this is fine. Okay, so this is secondary active transport. Okay, and if the two are being moved in opposite directions, as I've just shown, uh, then it's called an antiporter, whereas if they're being moved in the same direction, i.e. green's electrochemical gradient uh, favours its movement in this direction, okay, to the right, and blue's electrochemical gradient favours its movement in the opposite direction to the left, uh, then if we're moving them in the same direction, that's called a symporter. Okay, right, so that's secondary active transport. Okay, so we'll call it there for this video, and then in the next video, uh, we will start our discussion of the ABC transporters uh, by looking at the 49 human ABC transporter genes.